I think this would be a good time to begin. So, welcome to our talk on the Rococo this afternoon. Um, we have some upcoming talks that we'd like to just draw your attention to before we begin today's talk. On January the 21st, Irene is going to be giving a discussion, a lecture on York Minster stained glass. And then February the 18th, I'm going to do a presentation on Notre Dame de Paris. And in March, we're going to look at the iconography of the Passion in time for Easter Sunday, which is on the 31st of March. And on April the 21st, we thought we would have a look at James Tiso, The Life of Christ. And the next three months, May, June, July, sort of up in the air, we're still trying to decide, but we're thinking we might do papal portraiture. Then we might have a further look at the decorative arts and the role of the chalice in the mass, and then finally finishing with Van Gogh. Um, but if any of you have any topics that you'd like us to explore, please tell us. Otherwise, we'd just be happy to continue plucking out subjects from our imaginations. So let's begin with our prayer to St. Lucy, whose feast was on Wednesday and is the patron saint of light. So, Father Daniel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O St. Lucy, you prefer to let your eyes be torn out instead of denying the faith and defiling your soul. And God, through an extraordinary miracle, replace them with another pair of sound and perfect eyes to reward your virtue and faith, appointing you as the protector against eye diseases. I come to you for you to protect my eyesight and to heal the illness in my eyes. May St. Lucy preserve the light of my eyes so that I may see the beauties of creation, the glow of the sun, the colour of the flowers and the smile of children. Preserve also the eyes of my soul, the faith, through which I can know my God, understand his meek teachings, recognise his love for me, and never miss the road that leads me to where you, St. Lucy, can be found in the company of the angels and saints. St. Lucy, protect my eyes and preserve my faith. Amen. 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 All right, so, light of the world, Rococo interiors. People have relied on candles for thousands of years to light their homes, their churches, their workspaces. And the problem with the modern world, and there are many problems with the modern world, but today's lecture, our problem is that light has become subservient to human imagination. We expect light. You can flick on a switch and it banishes all of the gloom and shadow illuminating our surroundings with a really clean, steady beam of burning tungsten. Such prevalence makes us forget that light is a luxury. No other period or culture has enjoyed a similar level of mastery over the application of light, its distribution and tonality, a point that has only just started to be addressed by art historians. Following a change in the sumptuary laws in 17th century France, the beeswax candle became widely available to the aristocracy. This ease of access to a once exclusive light source had a knock-on effect on the period's architecture. <laughs> Gilding, mirrors, varnished furniture, stucco, carved wainscoting and paintings were effectively curated by architects to establish a new interior that took full advantage of the clean, beautiful light from beeswax candles. This afternoon we're going to look at the emergence of the Rococo in France during the first half of the 18th century and the implications that this style had on both domestic and ecclesiastic interiors. So before we plunge into candle production in France and the sumptuary laws which surrounded their use, I think it would help us to re-familiarise ourselves with the humble candle. Candlelight brings movement and animation. If we think of the words we use to describe a flame, it can gleam, glow and shine. It can twinkle, shimmer, glint and flicker. Sometimes, if it's being very naughty, it can sputter, spark and spit, or it won't light at all. Sometimes, it's almost as though the flame is alive. 
Its flickering makes our surroundings appear to dance before our eyes as it is swayed by drafts and movement. And we have a live demonstration which might flicker and sparkle and spit depending on how we move and breathe. So just to add to the atmosphere. <laughs> um, for a long time, light and shadow were understood as material counterparts. In the 21st century, we have a bias towards Newtonian thought, which asserts that light consists of rays and particles which travel in a steady beam. If you block the light, you create a shadow. Therefore, we tend to see shadow as an absence of light, something that's lacking. We don't see the two together. However, if we truly want to understand art prior to the 20th century, we must remind ourselves of the contrary, that shadow is a product of light's behaviour, and the two go hand in hand. In Physico Matisse's De Lumine Coloribus et Iridae, Francesco Maria Grimaldi maintained that light behaves as a rolling, pouring, undulating and trembling matter in flux, sharing similar traits to a fluid. Grimaldi's theory suggested that light's movement through space could be measured and traced by the trail of shadows left in its wake, as though it were a boat making waves as it pushed through the water. It was the latter of the two schools of thought which inspired further experimentation by 18th century French scientists and endured among the literate, because it accepted shadow as part of an aestheticised whole, rather than abstracting it via a mathematical discourse. Grimaldi's work was published in 1665. Nevertheless, artists were already displaying sensitivity to the relationship between light and shadow. So if we have a quick look at the Magdalena Reitzman by Georges de la Tour, depicted here, painted between 1625 and 1650, I think I've got that date wrong. Anyway, um, 1643. If you look at the way this painting has been, um, this, the Magdalena has been depicted, there are various types of shadow. The shadow behind the mirror and the shadow by her knee are much darker than the shadow that's going down her hair or the shadow that's skittering across her blouse, which indicate depth and tone and texture. And then there's the shadow of her back against the brown wall behind her. And I don't quite know how it's been translated onto the TV, but from pictures, it's actually painted slightly bluer. And the blue and the orange contrast against one another to create a flickering, moving sensation because they're complementary colours. This is further reinforced by the candle itself. If you look, the candle in our plane, there is a slight curve on the flame right at the top, but the candle in the mirror is almost straight upwards, again creating a flickering, dancing, moving sensation. As our eyes flick over both depictions, it gives us the impression of a lively, animated flame. And this also reinforces our understanding of light and shadow as material counterparts. Obviously, standing as a metaphor for Jesus, the candle brings harmony to the scene as we observe the way it touches the Magdalena through light and shadow and all that surrounds her. The shadow expressed by the light's caresses. So in the 13th century in France, the use of beeswax candles was controlled by sumptuary laws, which ensured that access to this object was restricted to royal and ecclesiastical circles. An edict put in place by Philippe IV in 1294 set forth that no member of the bourgeoisie, neither stable boy nor clerk, if he is not a prelate or of higher rank, will have access to a wax candle. Any light source fashioned out of wax was prohibited to those below the king or clergy. And they, anybody using candles that weren't of these ranks would have been punished. Reasons for this control lay in the quality of light that beeswax emitted when lit. The uniform pallor of filtered wax was considered superior to the rather beast hues of tallow, which yields quite a smoky, flickering and often quite smelly flame by comparison. The differences in light quality, it was thought, lay in their alternative sources, 
Bees, as aerial flying creatures, were considered holy creatures, and they still are. Their sanctity was proven by the ability of wax to float on the surface of water, an indication of purity of soul of the bee. In addition, the clean burn of the wax candle also asserted the chasteness of the bee. By contrast, tallow was extracted from the body fat of terrestrial animals. Heavy, smelly, a little bit flawed, plodding along, not light, and beautiful, and working hard like a bee. As creatures of the earth, their existence on land automatically made them of lesser nobility. So, as God's representative on earth, during the Middle Ages, the king's vocation in France was to visit his subjects via a travelling court. He'd pack up his government, along with an assortment of tapestries and tents, and spend the year riding around the kingdom, checking that each region and its subjects were content and sustained and stable. And we've got two examples here. So you can see the king sitting right at the top. He's in blue, he's wearing uh, fleur de lis, kind of blends in with the background. I don't think that was intentional. And then you have the nobility either side of him. And then you have bourgeoisie and farmers trying to get access into this makeshift court. And here's our friend Philippe IV as well. Um, this is Edward I of England kneeling to the King of France. As Duke of Aquitaine, Edward was a vassal to the French King. So as these assemblies, or Parlement, where we get the word for Parliament from in England, grew in wealth, their power increased. They had their own armies, and they were able to declare war, with or without the King's consent. Thank you. In addition, <laughs> Laws and edicts issued by the Crown were not made official in each region until the Parlement gave their assent by publishing them. The Parlement served as a watchdog, verifying the compatibility of the King's orders with that of the ancient privileges and laws of the Kingdom of France, and had the right to reject anything that undermined them. This would not have posed a problem if the aristocracy had stayed true to their vocation and served the King. By the time Louis XIV took to the throne in the 17th century, around 1643. He was five years old by this point. The nobles had already had powers reduced by the king's father, Louis XIII, and his advisor, Cardinal Richelieu. Perceiving the king's weakness as a child monarch, the aristocracy chased Louis XIV and his mother out of Paris during what's known as the Fronde. These memories would haunt young Louis, making him distrustful of both aristocrats and the church until the end of his days. So, Louis XIV was declared of age in 1661. His first step to regaining control was deciding to rule without a chief minister or immediate family members, selecting nobility from the petty bourgeoisie, so judges and tax farmers and that kind of rank, rather than noblemen from the feudal aristocracy. Recognising the widespread public yearning for law and order, a result of prolonged foreign wars and domestic civil strife from the nobility, Louis XIV built a national army, consolidating central political authority and reform, and again, this was at the expense of the feudal aristocracy. And finally, he improved French GDP by insisting France produce its own material goods, rather than importing from other countries. A prime example is the establishment of the Royal Manufactory of Mirrors in Paris and also the Royal Manufactory of Wax, which we'll get onto slightly later in this presentation. And this was really to compete with Venice and other major producers across Europe. And his final act of power, he moved his government out of Paris, which understandably he hated as he was driven out from it as a child, and into Versailles. Have any of you had the opportunity to visit Versailles? Yes. What did you think of it? Grand, grand, grand big? It's too big. Yes, it is too big. Um, I'd like to do a presentation on Versailles. I think maybe, <laughs> maybe next, um, yeah, next term because I was I was on such a tangent looking at Louis the Fourteenth and his Gallicanism and the way that he used art. But anyway. Um, this is necessary for understanding why we had the Rococo. 
By moving his government to Versailles, Louis XIV took control not only over the aristocracy, but also the main body of administration. Here he was primus inter pares amongst the prominent figures of the time, who would spend fortunes on any chance to maintain their position with the king. By requiring that nobles of a certain rank and influence spend time each year at Versailles, Louis prevented them from developing their own regional power at the expense of his own and kept them from countering his efforts to centralise the French government, thereby creating an absolute monarchy. According to the historian Philip Mansell, the king turned the palace into an irresistible combination of marriage market, employment agency and entertainment capital of aristocratic Europe, boasting the best theatre, opera, music, gambling, sex and, most important, hunting. Apartments were built to house those willing to pay court to the king. However, the pensions and privileges necessary to live in a style appropriate to their rank were only possible by waiting constantly on Louis. For this purpose, an elaborate court ritual was created wherein the king became the centre of attention and was obsessed throughout the day by the public. With his excellent memory, Louis could then see who attended him at court, who was absent, then facilitating the subsequent distribution of favours and positions. Another tool Louis used to control his nobility was censorship, which often involved the opening of letters to discern their author's opinions of the government and king. Moreover, by entertaining, impressing and domesticating his courtiers with extravagant luxury and other distractions, Louis not only cultivated public opinion of him, but he also ensured the aristocracy remained under his scrutiny. Cut off from their ancestral chateaus in the country, the nobility were without power and without purpose and actually without vocation as well. Removed from their ancient duties, they had no choice but to serve the king, pursuing all the vanities that he imposed upon the French court. So let's have a quick look at the Baroque as a point of comparison to the Rococo, because the Rococo is often described as the lesser cousin of the Rococo. So let's have a look at what's going on with the French Baroque. What made Louis XIV a truly modern king was his ability to instill terror into his subjects through world-class art. In France, the Baroque was initially inspired by its Italian counterpart, However, Louis XIV used this architectural style to assert his position as God-ordained king rather than celebrating the virtues of the Catholic Church. Under the artistic vision of the Sun King, the French Baroque gave precedence to the king's heroism through epic architecture, classical painting and unyielding symmetry. And we have some examples up here to give you a flavour of the Baroque or the French classic style. So up here we have an armoire and it might be quite difficult to see, but you can see it's almost like a classical building in that it has three clear sections and then it has furniture feet on the bottom. So, where am I? The bottom looks a little bit like a retable. The middle has decorative features and it has two female um, columns called caryatids. It also has Corinthian palisades, which are basically columns that are stuck to a wall. You know, when you see the sort of, they're like columns, but they're like little squares that are stuck. That's what a palisade is, if you don't know. And they're all flanked in marble. The top has a gable or it has a circle with urns on top and is also flanked in marble. And then the animal feet ties to classical antiquity. Furniture was logical, it was ordered, it belonged to the building, that's why it had architectural properties. You didn't move furniture. The idea of moving furniture is actually a highly modern phenomenon. It actually began in the 18th century. Um, the architecture as well, so if you look down here, we have a small print of a hallway, and you can see there are a lot of geometrical shapes, squares, circles, rectangles, it's all very orthogonal, it's all very rectilinear, um, and um, it's balanced as well. There's also examples of marquetry, which was a big thing in the 17th century. So 
They're very, again, they're very symmetrical despite the natural motifs that they are representing. So the gardens of Versailles were designed to show the king's power over the world um, with nature herself snipped and preened to perfection. Um, this is an example of bull furniture, which Louis XIV was absolutely gaga for. It was his favourite type of furniture. Um, he awarded Charles Bull so many privileges during his short time as Louis' cabinet maker. Um, it's instantly recognisable because you have layers of pewter, tortoise shell and gold leaf encased in ebony. It reflected light in a specific way, affirming that it was the Sun King who brought light into the world. Without him, the aristocracy would literally be in the dark. And then a final note on the painting. So this is part of a huge painting series on the ceiling of the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. Um, and it stretched across the ceiling. It was executed by Charles Lebrun in 1681 to commemorate all of the victories of Louis XIV and his reign. And um, here's the Sun King. You can see he's the point of light in the painting. This is the brightest point, King Louis. And you have Minerva swooping down to offer him wisdom. And then in the corner, it's very difficult to make out, we have France dressed in Bourbon um, fleur de lis, representing the fact that she belongs to the king holding the king, handing the king an olive branch, and also stamping out the mythological figure of discord and envy, aka his subjects that had tried to rise against him. And underneath this painting, it is, there is the title, The King Governs By Himself. So, I mean, kind of sums up Louis XIV's reign and what he was like as a monarch. So Louis wanted to improve French GDP and achieve this by several methods during his reign. And one way he achieved this was by reversing the sumptuary laws on the beeswax candles. Louis was keen to compete with Venice, which was also the capital of candle production in Europe. He was also wary that he had spent much of the country's budget on fruitless wars and needed to raise funds without imposing taxes on the aristocracy. Sir Trudon, a small grocer's founded by Claude Trudon in 1643, had been providing the candles for Versailles for a number of decades. Now, Monsieur Trudon's candles were favoured because of the quality he brought to the product. Beeswax candles were, sought, were a sought-after commodity, and it was common to find bootlegged versions on the market. They were often cut with flour, butter and pig's fat. Trudon developed a method to manufacture candles so that they were free of any harmful substances. The wax would be filtered several times before being left to bleach in the sun, and the result was a pure white candle unlike anything else on the market. And Sir Trudon are still in operation to this day as luxury candle manufacturers. And if you're ever in Paris and you go past one of their shops, do have a look because their candles are amazing. Gentle plug. It's not entirely clear when the nobility were permitted to buy beeswax candles for personal use. However, by 1688, the comedian Jean de la Bruyère had written a satire on candle consumption in Paris, noting that previous generations of Parisians had reserved wax for the altar and for the Louvre and the royal palace. La Bruyère commented that by his time, Nobles preferred to suffer poverty and deprivation so long as they could afford to light themselves up with beeswax candles. Trudon's candles were, of course, very expensive, costing 30 gold coins per candle. And to put this in perspective, a soldier's annual salary was 150 gold coins. So it was extortionate. Candles were actually used in the court of Versailles in place of currency. They held that much status among the nobles and the courtiers and the people who were running the Maison du Roi. It's absolutely fascinating. So, Louis XV died in 1715, leaving the throne to his great-grandson, Louis XV. 
At this point, Louis XV is five years old and is far too young to reign. The Duc d'Orléans forms a regency on behalf of the young king. Now, the Sun King had grown excessively pious towards the end of his reign, to the extent that he had banned theatre and gambling in Paris and had imposed a 6pm curfew on the nobility so that they would focus more on prayer and spiritual growth. Not the most popular of moves. From the start of his regency, the Duc d'Orléans relaxed these impositions, scrapped the excessive piety, giving the aristocracy their first taste of freedom for over half a century. Following the many wars Louis XIV had waged, France could no longer sustain any military offences either. And this period, the first half of the 18th century in France, this was known as a great period of peace and the art comes to reflect it. From the Baroque classicism invoked by Louis XIV emerged the Style Régence and then the Rococo. And you can see the beginnings of the Rococo in this painting. So here's Louis XIV. He's surrounded by his um, ancestors. So you have Henri X, or Henri X. Um, you have Louis XIII, who was father to Louis XIV. Louis XIV's son, Louis the Grand Duke. And then Louis the Grand Duke's son, so the grandson of... Louis XIV, guess what his name is? Louis. Another Louis. Um, he was a duke. And then his son, Louis XV, Duke d'Anjou. This painting was completed posthumously as well. This is Madame de Ventador. There was a measles outbreak in France in 1712. And she kept the young Dauphin safe. In 1699, Louis XIV apparently declared, I want a much lighter, more gentler style to decorate my palace. And it's starting to appear. So you've got a little bit of an arabesque, a slight flourish underneath this carving of Apollo. You have a festoon or a slight garland of posies and roses falling casually down. And then over the classical architecture, which would have dominated in classical Louis XIV style, these beautiful trees are emerging, pushing up and covering it. Nature is starting to reclaim what's hers. So let's have a look at the Rococo. It has a negative reputation. Often in art history, it's seen as a little bit of titillation. It's described as decorative, frivolous, decadent, or the dreaded art for art's sake. And this is quite an unfair reading of the movement. Any work of art risks becoming frivolous and self-indulgent when the conditions in which it was created have been forgotten or destroyed. The English word ornament, like the French ornement, is derived from the Latin noun ornamentum, which has its etymological roots in the verb ordinare, to put in logical order or to organize. We need ornament. We lack it in today's day and age. We go past buildings, they're blank, they're streamlined, they're, they're missing something quite integral. Ornament directs the eyes and the mind and the heart towards an authority, describing the boundaries and tone of a building, why we have a building. And for those who are still a little bit dubious about the role of ornament, consider the lack of ornamentation on the buildings today and how confused people seem to be nowadays. Just bear it in mind as food for thought. So the Rococo, or the Rocai, was used by the aristocracy to regain a sense of identity and self-expression after the death of their absolute monarch, Louis XIV. With more money and freedom, the aristocracy were able to purchase land between Paris and Versailles to build what was known as an hôtel particulier, most more of a house than a home these great buildings were used to welcome guests from a variety of backgrounds behaving as public buildings for the nobility to conduct their affairs most of these hotels were built along the champs elysees as well and were understood to occupy two realms the city but also the countryside 
And therein lies the beginning of what's considered the classic Rococo interior. Traditionally, the Rococo is characterised by asymmetrical organic flourishes, which you can see here. Really, it's borrowed from the Italian grotesque, which basically is a type of rural country style from Italy that the nobles in Paris quite liked and thought it resonated with them because they missed their country dwellings. Um, so it was quite appropriate for a group of people who've been uprooted from their ancestral lands. You can also see there are many natural motifs in this. There are sea scrolls there and there, um, which are isolated um, acanthus leaves from the Corinthian column. And just very quickly, for those who don't know what the Corinthian order is, um, the Roman Corinthian column is correlated to opulence, sophistication, luxury and grandeur. Acanthus leaves resemble a crown. So you can see these leaves here. Those are acanthus leaves. And you can see how they've been appropriated and changed by the French nobility and the Rococo for their own expression. However, it was also necessary to have a sense of balance. You couldn't have your um, carvings too thick or too thin. If they were too thin, they'd look miserly. Nor could you have them too big, too thick, too large, because then they'd be considered overly opulent and decadent. And this was especially true when candles came into the mix and we're illuminating these features as well. Rooms were much smaller and intimate, which Louis XV himself preferred. None of this grandeur at the Hall of Mirrors. Smaller rooms allowed for greater ease of communication and intimacy bringing a sense of warmth, wanting to talk to people, wanting to socialise, um, friendliness. Up here you have an example of lambris or wainscoting. Um, these were carved motifs on a wall which were always gilded and they often contained things called trophies or cartouches which are kind of like sort of circular shapes in which the aristocracy would include um, references to personal pursuits and interests. Walking around these hotels, you'd often find mythological figures, allegories of science and art, the seasons, whatever the nobleman wanted. Initially, this was used to insulate houses. The laundry was intentionally carved to take advantage of the changing light and of the candlelight. The lighter schemes in route in the room were um, able to become a reality as well thanks to beeswax candles. You wouldn't want to be painting your walls white, which was very expensive, if your house was lit up with tallow candles. It just wouldn't make sense. You'd have smoke and stickiness all over the place and it would be vile. Um, the Rococo is also associated with shells and um, originally the word Rococo derives from the word coquille, uh, which is like a sort of broken shell garden. Um, but I'm not entirely confident that this is correct um, because I was doing some research for this presentation. There were a lot of um, ancient French heraldry that had shells on. It would make sense if you're a noble person or a nobleman. You no longer have your ancestral home. You want to prove who you are. You don't really have your escutcheon anymore. You're going to stick scallop shells on the wall instead. Possibility. Um, Mirrors as well, you can just see this beautiful light little mirror, so different to the very heavy baroque that we were looking at earlier. Um, mirrors replaced classical figures and the sole purpose of a mirror was to make the rooms appear larger and to create greater depth. They weren't actually there to expand or to um, reflect the light because the tain or the backing of the mirror was too dark in order for that to take place. Mirrors were there really for optical illusion and for trickery. They were quite fun. Um, and finally, classical figures, they did exist, but they were often painted as overdoors. They were part of the lambris and the wainscoting. And they often pertain to love, or again, the pursuits and disciplines of the building's owner. Decoration in these houses served as a game. You couldn't directly look or stare because it was also considered polite. So you couldn't say, oh, that's a nice bit of 
shell work and roses. Oh, I like that. No, that would be considered really rude and gauche. It was a very tricky game to play and it also betrayed their insecurity as um, one of the ruling classes in 18th century France. So, moving back to candles, in 1719, Cire de Proudhon becomes the royal manufactory of wax. Mm. And Europe couldn't keep up with the demand for wax during the 18th century. In France, it was normally provided um, to the... Um, sorry, I wrote something wrong. So in France, people obtained wax from Normandy, Brittany, Auvergne and Champagne. However, because the demand was so high, because it outstripped the kingdom's ability to supply this material in bulk, wax had to be imported from Constantinople, Alexandria, and other countries from the east. And there were many other candles on the market as well. Some were made of spermaceti, so basically the liquid in the head of sperm whales, and those were imported from China. And if you really, really wanted to celebrate and show off your light, you would have firework candles. You would have beeswax candles cut with gunpowder. Yeah. Not entirely safe, <laughs> but certainly has a fantastic effect. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so the use of beeswax candles became standard for the Parisian elite by the 1750s and 60s. In the um, essay on the history, essay on the general history and on the morals and spirit of nations, Voltaire recounts the history of France up to the reign of Louis XIV and uses the beeswax candle to prove the improvements in living standards across Europe. This is also confirmed by the Encyclopedia, published in 1765 by Diderot, which states under the entry for cire or wax that, especially today, wax is no longer used, no longer uniquely reserved for the altar or for the Louvre. And everybody can now light themselves with these wax candles. Sir Trudon was particularly praised by Diderot and was championed as the gold standard in candle manufacturing at the time. So it, it, it was a huge deal. And it, it's, been, it's been mainly overlooked by art historians up until recently. So let's get some Rococo in motion. Let's actually see how this works. So this is the Hotel Subis. It is my favourite building in the whole world. It's in the Archive Nationale in Paris, and if you've never been, you have to go. I insist. Um, so the Hotel Subis is the absolute prime example of the Rococo. It was first built in the 14th century with its ownership tracing back to the Knights Templar. It subsequently served as the Paris residence of the Duke of Guise. <coughs> it's sort of in the Marais and the Pompidou, so it's kind of poked in. So it's not like a big house on the Champs-Élysées, but it was bought by the Rohan Soubise family in 1700. Germain Bofrand was commissioned as early as 1732 by Hercule Mériadec, the 80-year-old Duke de Rohan, to redesign the hotel as a palliative for his 19-year-old bride, Marie-Sophie de Corsillon. Bofrand said that the sciences and the arts had such a great rapport that the principles of one are the principles of the other. He knew what he was doing. He demonstrated an excellent understanding of light in his Livre d'Architecture, in which he describes the importance of candle height, insisting that they not be too high, or they'll make the ladies look aged, which they'll never forgive you for. Bofrand suggests tiered candelabrum to overcome this difficulty. While this could be seen as typical frivolous asymmetry of the Rococo, it actually reveals that Bofrand understands light as liquid, the light flows downwards and outwards as appro at appropriate points to facilitate the candle's burning rates. If light were a beam, this wouldn't matter. In January 1745, it's also worth noting, Germain Bofrand was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of London for his understanding of light and how it interacted with architecture. Um, Bofrand began redecorating the interior of the Hotel Soubise from 1735 to 1739. And we're going to have a look at the Prince's Chamber first. 
It looks really grand once you've stepped into it. Has anyone been here before? You have. I made you go. <laughs> okay, so it seems really grand. It's about the size of this room, minus the kitchen. It, it's really big. Um, and it's draped in red and gold and um, damask. And um, it's actually quite delicate when you take a moment to look because it gives primacy to texture and depth. It doesn't pit light against shadow as the Baroque seemed to. So you've got these cartouches here. So that's a cartouche. They're dotted around the room and they have mythological couples. Again, it's a palliative for a 19 year old girl for marriage. Um, and this one, we have the Rape of Europa. Throughout the day, such scenes display an array of tonalities and forms that alter depending on the position and intensity of the sun. But under the veil of night, they would exude animacy by the dancing flames of candlelight. Buffron's deployment of these luminescent narratives throughout the Hotel Subis is exemplary for this very reason. Sadly, I don't have an example of that from the Hotel Subis, but I do have an example from the bathroom of Louis XV, completed in 1771. <coughs> We've got Diana at her bath. So you've got the change in daylight, but it also appears to be a change in narrative as well. There's great relief in the photo um, at night. Her stomach and her breasts are full. Um, the nymph is reaching out by her knee and the flickering candle by the king's bath um, would make her body appear to be animated and moving. And you're less aware of Actian as well, the spying man who's hiding behind the tree. And this is a typical game employed in, by the style. So where's Actian? Does that mean we're the peeping toms? Um, there's also a bed. This would be a public room. A lot of the time you, you, know, you walk into big French stately homes and you just see a bed in the living room and you think, what? Why? What's going on? Well, it asserts the legitimacy of the family, their ties to the king, their vocation as noblemen, although that has dried up. The balustrade around the bed as well, it resembles an altar rail. It's the purity and privacy, but also the spectacle. We're here, we've survived. The bed represents family lineage and the the four posts at the top as well almost resembles a baldacchino. Um, research, yeah, it reasserts the legitimacy of the family, but also the classic couples and lavish decoration trembling under the candlelight were designed to facilitate the conjugal act. It's a really erotic room. It's great. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Um, it says yes to family. How many things say yes to family nowadays? And this is what it would have looked like at night. So imagine this room shimmering and trembling and dancing in candlelight. And you're standing before the family bed. Very atmospheric. The light would be rushing up as liquid from the chandelier and pouring out across the room, much like a fountain. And the reflections from the rosette follow the viewer as well around the room, again enhancing the agency of light. And I found a little satire as well of the stucco coming to life with the bright candles underneath and this young lady obviously having a moment. And here's a close-up of the rosette as well. So the arabesque appears to form Cupid's bows and there are tiny tiny little flames here, do you see? Right on the end. The wings of the putty as well here are in the rosette. There's a scabbard as well in the cartouche. Light is being drawn up from the lust, from the chandelier and shoots out across the room like a million tiny little arrows that will pierce your eyes, falling for the next beautiful guest that you may meet at the Hotel de Subise. By comparison, this is the princess's salon, which is adjacent to the prince's room. Buffrand has included the addition of the oval salons for both the prince and princess's apartments. And this was a new kind of room that served as a transitional place between grand state rooms and multi-purpose rooms that kept the feeling of privacy and intimacy. 
Light seems to gleam down the sides, do you see? As though water is dripping down the carvings on the Long Prix. And the rosette seems quite dry by comparison as well, reinforcing the imagery that the chandelier seems to behave like a giant fountain of light. And of course, it's a round room. It takes better advantage of the light as well than an orthogonal traditional square room. Um, it's a very playful, light, beautiful room. Going around and spinning around, it mimics the dizzying feeling of falling in love with somebody. And as I said, the aristocracy loved to play games. They knew what they were doing. Um, the narrative cycle as well is the cycle of, is the story of Cupid and Psyche. Psyche, here, she was warned by Cupid not to look at him in daylight. And then her sisters egg her on and say, oh, go on, you need to see what he looks like. You don't know what he's going to be like. So she listens to them. She holds up a candle. The wax pours and drips onto his skin, waking him up. And then he flees. So curiosity got the better of me. And I started to wonder, are there any Rococo churches that also aren't German Rococo churches? Do we have any French Rococo churches? And then I found 18, like pages and pages and pages of 18th century French chapels and it's a crime that none of them have really been seriously researched. So this is from the King's Personal Oratory in Versailles. It was completed in 1741 by Jacques Verbert. He is the man who carved all of the lombri in the Hotel Soubise that we just looked at. And you have vines and grape leaves. You have sheaves of wheat. Obvious nods to the Eucharist. You have angel wings underneath the scallop. Scallops also represent Christian pilgrimage as well. And again, angel wings around the king's emblem. It's absolutely beautiful. Not that I'm biased. And then I found some altars. So we have the design for the altar of Saint Sulpice in Paris. Have any of you been to Saint Sulpice? Again, very big. Um, you have two angels lifting up a monstrance, which is erupting light in straight orthogonal beams. But then the candles are reaching upwards as well. Heaven and earth meet. The logic of God, the truth and beauty of heavens are almost touching the unstable light of the bees and the light of the world. There's also the deposition underneath. And there's a very similar one in Versailles as well, made of solid gold. Um, so again, same principle, having that illuminated by candles, the idea of Christ moving and twitching, dying, expiring, candles expire too. Um, the church, saint Peace, is also built with the gnomon inside, which is basically a small opening in the church where the sun shines through at the equinox. And at the spring and at the autumn equinox, the sun travels across this meridian line. And it was built in order to facilitate further scientific experiments with light. We also have the design for the altar of saint Aignan of Orléans. And um, I also found another engraving of the cross, which is in a couple of slides. Um, Light again is depicted in straight beams surrounding a circular cloud or balakitakino. And you have two sculpt shells there as well. And it's so big and it's so animated. Um, just to finish off, I wonder whether the Rococo could also be seen as an homage to the family. So this is the Déjeuner by François Boucher, which was painted in 1739. For those of you who are unfamiliar with François Boucher's work, he's famed for painting Venuses with um, flowery cupids dancing around them, and is known for specialising in nudity. Uh, he's a great artist, but also underrated, because that's apparently what everyone wants to focus on. Um, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it intimate and small? And look at those candles taking pride of place as well on either side of the trumeau or the mirror. You've got candles, you've got a little clock in the corner by the sunlight. You have a Buddha as well. 
enlightened, oriental, importing, exporting, learning about the world. They're drinking coffee in a small, intimate space. You've got a tiny little lacquer, piece of lacquer furniture as well, picking up the light. And you've got children. And I think it's really an appreciation for the world around us and the senses that God has given us to understand his creation. And just to finish off, there are some very touching paintings by Boucher and his protégé Fragonard of the Holy Family. So this is the Adoration of the Magi. It was painted 1755 to 1760. And look, Christ is the brightest point in the painting. And the Magi, they're delineated in shades of black and brown. Even the angel and the star seem to be fading in the background as Christ is revealed to the world. And here, this one is also called The Light of the World. It was painted um, by Boucher for Madame de Pompadour for her chateau of Bellevue and Meldon in um, 1750. You've got this beautiful, soft, golden light falling down onto the Christ child and Our Lady. But again, here is the lightest point in the work. Something also appears to rise towards the light as well. There's, he's created this dynamic where the top and the bottom are sort of coming together in unison through his use of light. And Our Lady's foot, so gentle, so tenderly painted. Two eggs by her foot as well. She wouldn't dare crush those eggs. She would crush the head of the serpent though, which I think is what this is sort of nodding towards, but it's just such a poised, thoughtful and gentle painting. It's tender, which is what the Brock lacks sometimes, tenderness and gentleness towards others. So this is The Rest on the Flight to Egypt by Fragonard. It's, I've never seen this until I was trying to prepare for this um, presentation. Um, it was painted in 1774. And um, firstly, Joseph doesn't have eyes. He cannot really see. And also we can't see Mary's eyes either. And it makes sense because they're both, lo they're both lost and confused. It's the fog of uncertainty, but blind faith in God. However, again, it is the Christ child's eyes that we see as he is the light of the world and he is God and he can see and he knows. And then to finish, The Education of the Virgin, painted in 1773 by Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Now, he's painted this subject several times in his life. And this version, he had submitted to the salon and it was rejected. And look at the way that St. Anne's hands are placed by Mary, just gently on her hip, gently by the cat who's leaning into her. Look how Mary's leaning into her mother's bosom as well as she reads. It is a soft and intimate scene. And it is quite beautiful and quite touching. And um, yeah, that's basically the presentation. Thank you. We've got about five minutes for questions. I didn't go past half past. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Go on, Philip. Is your thesis that Rococo is an entirely French thing that's then exported to places like Austria and southern Germany? And indeed, I see it in churches in Spain and yeah. Portugal. And it, that's what that's so that's what it, we were taught. Started in France. It did start in France, yes, and then it was exported um, French taste to Spain, Italy, Austria, and Germany. Yeah, and it did begin in France. I had heard before, um, perhaps this is what you were saying, but, but that, that that it was the what happened when a candle was sort of blown in yeah. the wind and and the kind of asymmetrical mm. shape that was formed that kind of formed the um, type of, of Rococo architecture. Would you say oh, that's absolutely. Yes. I just yeah. didn't know if I had time to say that. Mm. But yeah, that um, certainly influenced the um, Rococo style. So if we have a look at the um, candle. So if yes, we look at yes. these, 
they very much look like flames. Or a candle or a that's, can that's kind of the wax. Of yes, the funny exactly, yeah. exactly. So the, the art is sympathetic to the medium. So if you imagine a candle melting down as well, you've got two moths trapped mm. within the design as well. You know, common saying, a moth to flame and the dangers. And then you've got the festoons and garlands dripping down as well. So yes, absolutely. And did you say it was called rocaille in French? Yes. And so rococo is the Italian name for rocaille. Rococo is the English name. Oh, is it? Yes. What do they call it in Italy? I think they, I think they must call it rococo, but the English picked up on the rococo from the rocaille in the 19, early 19th century as a way to deride the French style. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you have any more questions? Come the French Revolution, was yeah. the scene as decadent? Yes, it was. Yeah. It was. Um, I respect that this was a very biased presentation. And um, of course, the nobility lived the life of absolute luxury. And um, the French people did not have enough food, did not have. Well, they hardly had anything. We still had to. Candles, maybe. I'm, well, exactly. Yes, candles, yeah, not even for beeswax candles. Um, yeah. Tallow yeah. was the main um, source of light for many people, even nut oil if you were very poor. Um, yeah, it, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it is all from the point of view of the uh, nobility in France. So. In quite a narrow sphere to live in as well, I should imagine. If you go to the um, Castle Museum in the in the Victorian street that's been created and they really did the smells of the street as well. Um, there's one uh, sort of back alley um, and one of the there's a, a, a candle maker sort of shop and it's full with like basically fat candles mm. and mm. they've recreated the obviously the smell and <sighs> It is awful, it like, and it's not as intense as it would have been. Like apparently, like it made your eyes like, you make you cry because yeah. it's just so, just yeah, just it's just awful. Yeah, it's, I thought. Like, imagine your house smelling like that <laughs> oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah. It's horrible. To, you need the light. Yeah. For it, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.